Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. For maybe the internet, and so preparation to Bible study, spiritual book, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. Can't live it, can't learn it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. The Holy Spirit is grieved and quenched. If you're a spiritual person, you know that. It's evidence in your spirit. What do you do? You confess your sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, and 1 John 1, 9 works off verse 7, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That's the work of Christ on the cross in regard to the Christian and personal sin. When you confess that sin, you're restored to fellowship in the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, and that fellowship of dynamic of ministry is back functioning in your life in a positive way. So I ask you to do those type of things because that's proper Bible study. That's etiquette for Bible study. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us by automobile and Internet. Realize that probably some people that would normally be here are home guarding their homes and passing out uh, candy and, and giving the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we do at our house. And so, you know, it's not about a piece of candy. It's about the grace of the home that gave it. People come and knock on your door, and what a great opportunity it is to share the gospel with Jesus, of Jesus Christ. So I'm thankful for Halloween at my home. I meet people I would never meet probably, and especially little kids, and it doesn't take but 30 seconds to present the gospel while well, you're handing them candy. They're, they seem to leave happy for whatever reason. So, Father, we pray for that. Pray for a safe night out there for the little children. There are a lot of mean people out there. And I uh, hope everybody that went out is properly, as a proper guardian with them. And so tonight we look at our le lesson, Father, on the subject of confidence in the will of God. I mean, how important is that? Well, we're in a, in a passage where people are, are losing everything. Their property is being seized and they're left with nothing unless they know God. And if they know God, then they're, they're left with everything. If you know God through Jesus Christ, you're never alone. You've never been forsaken. You're not forgotten. You can lose everything and have God, and that's the most valued possession you'd ever get in this earth and this journey. And so we pray for that tonight as we might understand confidence in the will of God as we make our journey through this life and touch as many souls as we can, like Horton last night. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Well, here we are in Hebrews, 10th chapter, 35, 36. Let's take a look at this. Hebrews 10, 35, 36. Therefore, that's un, that's a trailer hitch. So what he closed out with verse 34 is important. So let's back up 34 for you. And this goes back to 30, 32 where they're now being 32 through down to where we are. They're being persecuted for their faith in Christ by their own people. These Jewish believers being persecuted by their own people in so many different ways. And verse 34, you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property because you know two things. Ganasco, you know this is complete understanding of, of the doctrinal truth or the promises given by God to you in regard to this categorical doctrine. He says, because you know that you have for yourself a better possession that's eternal and an abiding one or everlasting one. That's what goes with therefore. <laughs> and 
what goes with therefore is the jo- being able to accept joyfully based on knowing that you have a better possession on ever, and an everlasting one. Therefore, now that's important, isn't it? Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which, which is a very interesting word. It's a word nothing like ours in the English. I mean, the, the confidence is as close as you could get to it. And we'll talk about that tonight as part of my subject. Do not throw away your confidence through undeserved suffering. Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Now, pay attention to that. Now, he's, he's giving you a clue on that. Where, where, where is this great reward going to be? See, better, better possessions and everlasting ones, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, the eternal always, always over, overshadows and outweighs the temporal. That's the point. Don't throw away your confidence, which is great reward, for you have need of endurance. That's run the race to the finish. Endurance, run the race to the finish. You have endurance so that when. Here's another so that when. So that when you have done the will of God. That's finish the course. Whatever race you're in, listen, by now you know you're going to be in a lot of races in life. Over the will of God. The will of God is going to sign you up into a lot of different races. And we know them categorically. The idea is to complete them. To finish them. <coughs> stay, stay on course until you finish it. Finishing it means you have, listen to me. Finishing it means you have done the will of God. You know, Jesus said it a different way. He said, when I come back, what I'm looking for is to find faith in my people. Right? faithfulness it's faithfulness for you have need of endurance run the race that sets before you so that when you have done the will of God you will receive what was promised now let, let's see how sharp you are tonight on Halloween night okay what do you what do you think now we're talking about eternal we know because therefore set us up with we're talking about eternal rewards right the rewards are eternal the things that have been promised that we're, we're going to get our rewards if he's promised you're going to get it but he's going to get it in eternity not in time i mean what you get in time is grace and you get plenty of it what is it that you get that's promised for eternity to run the race to the finish of undeserved suffering. Crown of life. James 1.12, Revelation 2.10. It's crown of life. Now that, I don't know, you know, we're not a, cor- a culture that's crown oriented. You know, if you say it to most people today, they think about teeth or something. Oh, I wish you wouldn't mention crowns, they say, because I... Just had a couple put in there and financially in pain. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. Culturally, we're talking about a crown. We're talking about a victor's hat. We're talking about a victory hat. We're, we're talking about winning the World Series or the National Championship or something. We're talking about something is so far out there, a crown of life. Two, two great words for crown. One is the wreath of the yes. victor and one is... Yeah. Yes. This is the race of the victor. It is. It is. Stephanos. It's a Stephanos. Mm-hmm. It's the victor's crown. It's the wreath that the victor. And, and, and it came off from the apparently athletics uh, of the day, uh, the Greek Olympics. But, but listen, being God, and, and listen. What do we hold on to in this life as we go through these trials and testings and that? We hold on to the promises of God. And, and what's the key of that? When you get a promise of God, what's it? Now, listen to me. What's the key in it? The will of God. Now, let me go back. Do not throw away your confidence. Was a great reward for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you get, the, you, you get what's been promised. Do you see that? The whole testing of undeserved suffering is about the will of God. 
and your endurance, which means to run the race to the finish. And, and, and listen, you're going to run many of these things. Um, the thing is to be faithful to the end, but whatever, whatever he, whatever race he enters you in, no matter how difficult it is, no matter what it is, and some are difficult and some aren't, some were, were really prepared for it and others were not in our minds, but God knows you are because he never puts you in a race that you're not prepared to be able to run uh, to the finish, right? We're not talking about whether you place first, second, or third. We're talking about finishing. I love that. I mean, crawl, whatever you have to do, you get across the finish line. And, um, but anyhow, so we're talking about confidence in the will of God. You see, uh, the main thing is that you see what's all in gate. Here you are, you're, you're in the race called undeserved suffering. And you got to run that race to the end. Now, for Job, he saw the end while he was still in life. Some people might not see it till they get to the end of life, right? Maybe they may have something on them that, that's not going to get off from them. They're in it till they, till they finish their course. It doesn't matter. You stay until the race is finished, okay? You stay in the course. And what you're doing is you're, listen to me, you're doing the will of God. You're doing, not learning. You've already learned that. When you learn the will of God, he enters your race to do the will of God. And you get reward because you have endured and finished the race of life or, or whatever race that is. You receive the crown. If it's undeserved suffering, if you finish it, you get the crown of life. And um, that's, that's a pretty powerful idea. So the word therefore, he says, do not throw away your confidence. Uh, parousia, you're going to see that word in when it's used in verse 35 um, and 36, when it's used in context there, the, that... Um, um, well, I'm just saying that it's used in context. Uh, there's a definite article with it. There's a definite article. So the reason I call this confidence in the will of God is because there's definite article with that, which highlights it. He's highlighting when he puts a definite article, because you don't have to do that. You can say a confidence, but when he puts the, it, it highlights it. And so confidence Therefore, in this passage, once I see there's a definite article as a student uh, of uh, scripture, then in the language, at least, that, that's important. Do you see the word which? Sometimes we don't pay attention to these little words. See that word which? He's talking about confidence, the confidence which. See, that, that thing should read, do not throw away your confidence. The confidence because confidence, see, that's what he's saying. Because confidence has great reward for you have need of endurance so that when, see, there's that when, so that, and, and by the way, that word so that is hina. It means divine purpose, the divine purpose. There's always a divine purpose in whatever race God enters you in, knows you're qualified to finish in doing the will of God. And, and listen, it's going to require endurance or, or maybe perseverance, you know, that idea. And, and, but, but doing the will of God, doing the will of God. And so this has become very important for us here tonight in that. And so we get a, the reward that's promised for the under, it, finishing uh, the race of undeserved suffering is the crown of life. Jane, I don't know if it's on, did I put it on your paper? James 1.12. Revelation 2.10, where it talks about that. I may not have put it on your paper. Now, listen, I over the years of teaching this, I've learned that it's a great challenge to believers. When, when I teach this subject, it becomes a great challenge uh, to believers who are suffering undeserved suffering, who have lost everything in their life of value, the earthly value, earthly value, nothing wrong with earthly values, people. 
is what you do when you lose them. <laughs> this is what the writer is talking about. There's nothing wrong with having them. Well, how do you adjust when you don't have them, when you lose them? That's what he's been talking about. That's what James talks about, doesn't he? Count it all joy, which we talked about last night. But it becomes the great challenge to people who hear this subject matter, who have lost everything but life itself, kind of like Job, who are under attack in the angelic conflict or you wouldn't be running the race of undeserved suffering. And so the writer says, here's the key. Do not throw away what? Your confidence. Your confidence. And what is it in? Listen to me. It's in the directive will of God. When he says doing the will of God, we call that the directive will of God. This is the will that has been revealed to you by promise. And you've engaged, he has allowed you to become engaged in it. And now it's a matter of enduring and keeping your head in the game. It don't matter if you're doing really, really good on the first lap. It matters how well you're doing on the last lap. <laughs> That's what we've learned. Now, remember this, that when he says, do not throw away your confidence, he, he tells you why, because there's two things. Do you see these two things? What are the two things? You have a great reward, which has been promised, and... Every time he enters you a race, there's always a prize. There's always a reward that's been promised. So that's important. Okay? And, and what he tells you, what, I, what I'm asking of you is to endure, persevere to the end of whatever I've put on your plate. And there will be great rewards. And listen, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of wonderful things that happen to your life. The way God fulfills a lot of things endurance is not just a big painful journey. I mean, God, God is going to coach you all the way. He's going to do things for you. When you think you can't go one more, he's going to lift you up and strengthen you. I mean, there is, there is so much that God does for you once you enter the race, when, it, when you come to that place where if you're a runner, it requires endorphins or you're going to quit. The early days of my life, I was a runner, and uh, until I realized I got addicted to it, and I didn't know until I got addicted to it that I got addicted to endorphins, which is nothing but a shot of heroin, and uh, and I went, "Hey, I better quit that because I ain't got enough time in my life to keep running." I mean, I was like Forrest Grump or Gump, Gump. I was like him. I started running. I couldn't quit. I mean, I, I was just going to run a mile, and then I ran three, and then I was at six, and then I was at ten, and I went like, I can't got enough time to do this, and I got crazy with it. But, but what I'm saying is like the endorphins. When you're running and you 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 hit a wall or you're at that place where you just tired, I just don't want to do it anymore. Why am I doing this? You get this this new life kicks in on you, and you go like, oh, I think I could do another mile or so. Uh, but you can't run out of those babies when they kick in, let me tell you, or you will get kicked in. But anyhow, I'm just, what I'm saying to you, when you, when you hit the endurance part of the race, what he's, he has he is, uh, put you in, this is where God begins to feed you uh, so many good things that you've learned, walking in the power of the Spirit, w walking by faith and not sight, uh, I am, I am there always with you. I'm there to build you up. And then you begin to see the spiritual aspect of your journey and your race. And that, that's, that's kind of like the endorphins kicking in. It's the, it's the things that you can only realize you have when you're in a place where they're needed. Does that make sense to you? That, I hope it does because that's, that's what I was after. And, and notice, what, notice how he says this. Notice how he says this. He says, you, you have need of endurance. See? You have need of endurance. And that's the reason I, I talked about the endorphins. 
let me talk about a couple of things here. I think three. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews makes an issue of the danger of throwing away your confidence when he says, do not do that. He puts it, this is not a command, that which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's rather a subjunctive. It's an aorist subjunctive of uh, apobalo. But he, he's warning us in, in a teaching mode. He's teaching, he's teaching this. He's not commanding. He's teaching it. I want you to learn this. This is a, co this is a coach that's teaching Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday to play the big game on Saturday. You know, practice business. And so that's the subjunctive of this idea. And he's talking about the danger and being prepared. I want you to be well informed. I want you to understand the game plan. Do not throw away your apobalo, your, your confidence in the will of God and uh, immense uh, great suffering. The Greek word for confidence, paresia, notice it's made up of two words. It's P-A-R is para, it's, it's uh, the par, it's par, P-A-R, and then R-H-E-S-I-A, risa. And what this word put together means, it means, it means to speak openly. This is where it it's kind, becomes kind of interesting word. And it was a big word in um, the Attic Greek for those who are historians. It means to speak openly, boldly, and publicly about some issue that you feel strongly about. And feel confident about speaking. You're passionate and confident about it. That's where you get that idea. In our lesson text, it is connected with the directive will of God. The directive will of God in the Greek language has a definite article with thelema, which is the plan of God broken down into decrees as wills. And the definite article with theos, identifying who the author of the plan of God is, God himself. And so this is kind of interesting the way the writer lays this out for us in our text. Uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Volume 5, on page 872. Here's what they say about this word. This is a, a Greek, this is a classic Greek discussion of the history of words, theological dictionary of theological dictionary of biblical words, doctrinal words. At the height of the Greek democracy, the full citizen, the full citizen alone had the right to say anything publicly in ecclesia, in an organized assembly. Not a mob in an organized assembly. For I mean, if you did, if you if you tried to do it in a mob, they put you in jail. You can't do this in a rebellion. You can't do it. You can't be. Well, anyhow. For this reason, there is no higher possession than parousia. This is the way the Greeks felt about it, and no greater loss than to lose it. You know what we call that? First Amendment. Where do you think we got that idea? It's right down the pike. Jesus was unwilling in, in one of the episodes of his life in John, the seventh chapter, the, the, the feast of tabernacles or booth came. And everybody, his family, he said, I'm not going this year. His family got after him. They thought this was a great opportunity for his ministry. You need to be going there. Uh, he said, I'm not going this year. His disciples said, this would be a great opportunity for us in our ministry. I mean, people from all over the world will be here. We ought to be there. And he said, no, we're not going this year. Uh, the crowds who were gathering at the Feast of Booth we're wondering where Jesus is because this would be a great opportunity for his ministry. The problem is when you read the seventh chapter of John, the Jews had put a hit contract out on him. 
They were going to kill him at this festival. They were going to kill him. They had a, they had a, a contract out on him. That's the language we would use today. You can read about this in John, the seventh chapter, one through 13. It's a very interesting story. It is interesting also when you get to verse 13, it talks about the crowd that was gathering at this feast. It says, yet no man was speaking openly about him for fear of the Jews. We're only in the seventh chapter of John. They're going to crucify this man in the 18th and 19th chapters. And so he doesn't go there because, listen, it's not his time. He's not afraid, that, he's not afraid of death, obviously, but it's not his time. I mean, that's how, listen, and who's running that deal? I mean, who, who do you think is promoting that deal? See, nobody's able, you and I ought to be able to watch the news and know what's pushing what. We ought to have the good sense to be able to read history and know how this really thing, how this thing really play out, plays out in the plan of God. Everybody couldn't see what was behind this. Not even his own disciples could see that this was an enormous plot. I mean, did they, listen, do you suppose that the, you suppose the family of Jesus didn't know? Listen, the whole crowd that had gathered for this feast knew that the Jews, the leadership of the Jewish nation was out to get them. Verse 13 tells you that. They were even fearful of speaking publicly about him for, for, for fear. Well, he doesn't show up at that, that place at that time, but our word does. Parisia is in verse 13, yet no one was speaking openly of him or about him. You see that? That's our word. And listen, what you're, not, what you're missing when you read that is this was a dynamic word for democracy. To have public discourse and to be able to speak between two civilized persons that felt passionate about an issue in a way that led to good debate and friendship. But see, that had been shut down by the enemy because of mob tactics and because the leadership had shut down public discourse. Do you see that? See, this, this word isn't just to speak boldly public. This is parousia. This is a dynamic word of the time of the culture of the First Amendment rights. This is how this is. This is a word. This isn't just some, I mean, you got to understand the dynamics of the history of the word that's being used here. Later in the 18th chapter, we find this word again. We're now in John 18, and Jesus has been arrested and is being interrogated by the Jewish court, by Annas. That's a preliminary hearing. All he had, Anna, 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 the the ex-high priest is like the head of a mafia. He had no, he had no uh, legal authority. He just had a whole lot of clout. And Jesus is brought before him. He's arrested, remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was arrested? Come on now. This is where he's taken in the middle of the night. He's taken to a preliminary hearing. And we're on, we're on the, listen, we're on the eve of Passover. These are the most corrupt people. <laughs> I mean, corrupt. Not because they're Jew, because they're evil. Make sure you can make a distinction there. You're not, they were just evil. This is evil, what they're trying to do. And so the Parisia, 
Parisia shows up again. It reappears. They're in a discussion in a preliminary hearing that is, is not authorized. This man has no legal authority, and he's running him through the mill. That's an interesting, it's a very interesting read on your part, John 18. And so he's quizzing, he's interrogating Jesus. And Jesus answered him and he said, I ha listen to what he says to him. I mean, and here's our word. And our word means a lot more than what you've seen in the English. Please tell me you know that. Well, tell yourself that then. <laughs> tell yourself that. I mean, if, if, you know, if you, if you really want to study this word, you, you go in there to the theological dictionary of New Testament words and, and jump in there. Take an all-day snack when you go, but jump in there. Jesus Andrew said, I have spoken openly. That's parousia. I have spoken op openly to the world. I've had nothing. I've been in... I've been in absolute public arena under the concept of parousia, the freedom to speak openly and honestly about issues that I'm passionate. The Greeks believed it. The Romans believed it. The Jews believed it. But evil is against it because what they're speaking openly about is God, is Christ. They sure don't like that. And when they don't like that, you know it's evil. And the guy who's running that show is Satan. I know. When I say that, then everybody goes like, he believes in Satan. I don't believe in him. I believe he exists. There's a difference. I have spoken openly to the world. That's our word, parousia. I have spoken openly to the world. I have also taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. See, secret, privately. I, have not, I am not behind some big rebellious push. Do you understand? I'm not starting, starting a revolution in the sense of against the government. I, I, have, I have exercised my right under parousia to the world and to every place I have spoken. I have spoken under the concept. See, you can't miss that now. I've spoken under the concept of parousia. That's what he's telling him. We miss it because we don't understand the word. Here's the second thing. As far as my study is concerned, you must understand how the will of God works. I mean, you study the Word of God, the Word of God takes you to the will of God, and the will of God takes you to the work of God, i.e. doing the will. You're not going to find the will of God apart from the Word of God. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. That's why the Bible is the most dynamic book of all the books of the library. This is why people, listen, this is why people hunger in other nations for the Bible. And that's why evil people censor the Bible from coming in or being operated. You know why? Because they know something that you don't or don't care about. The Bible is a powerful, life-changing book. We take it like, ah, I have a Bible. I don't have a Bible. I don't care. What do I care? Bible, Bible, Bible. All you, do, all you people do is study the Bible, study the Bible. Listen, you're not going to like heaven. <laughs> you're not going to like heaven. So you might as well get adjusted. If you want to go to heaven, you need to get adjusted to the primary book. Look, study it yourself. Open the Word of God and start reading it. It's a phenomenal book. When I was an unbeliever, I read it. I couldn't understand it, but I read it. I was, I was intrigued by the book. I was intrigued that people believed it. I got saved, and I started becoming a Bible-toting person. Couldn't believe that. How did that happen? I got saved. That's how it happened. 
That was the most important book in my life. I carried it everywhere I went. Still do, by the way. There are three categories of God's will that are important to the Christian way of life. You really need to understand this. This is basic, too. This is not, this is not deep theology, people. This is basic, but you got to get it. There's the directive will of God. There's the permissive will of God, and there's the overruling will of God. These are the, the if you want to learn about the will of God, you better learn those three, those three uh, categories. The directive will of God is what he reveals to you from the word of God about the choices for you to believe. The choices. Because it all boils down to volition, doesn't it? The choices. And I tell you, choices are, the choices in your life, I mean, down to, well, I, not, not to toilet paper, but, <laughs> but down pretty close to it, ought to be based on the word of God. Because I'm telling you, that's how important God thinks your life is to him. Now, you may not think that's how important your life is, but that is how important your life is to God. And he has covered your life over with the word of God, with promises that are gigantic. And they will turn a sad day into bright sunlight. Because the devil always wants you to live in the darkness, always wants to have gloom and doom. That is not what Jesus Christ is about. But to get to this place in your life, you got to understand that what the Bible is all about, what God is trying to do is teach you his will. His plan, his plan, it comes through the word. Through the word comes the will and out of the will comes the work. That's just how it goes. That's just how it is. That's why the Bible is a phenomenal book. Now, in Ephesians 5.17, listen to what he says. 5.17, here's a, here's a verse well, well worth your time. I'm going to tell you what it says. It says, do not be foolish. Do not be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Stop being foolish. Start understanding what the will of the Lord is. Stop being foolish. Be wise. Stop being foolish. Be wise. Wise. Be wise. Know what the will of the Lord is. In the Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse six, talks about, and when you discover what the will of God is, listen, what God wants to do is do it from your heart. He wants to do it from your heart. Your heart. That's where confidence in the will of God is. It's in your heart. It's not in your mind. It's in your heart. Doing the will of God from your heart. Doing the will of God from your heart. You know, when it's in your heart, you don't have to keep going back. Where was it? Where is it? Where is it? I can't find it. I can't find it. When it's in your heart, you know where it is. And the Holy Spirit pulls it out. He goes, cha-ching. That's why walking in the power of the Spirit, you learn so much doctrine, you go like, oh, geez, what, what are you doing? Holy Spirit's like, just relax, I got it. Cha-ching, there it is. I mean, you've had that, right? My, my, every day. Every day. What are you talking about? So here, here's Ephesians 5, 17, going over to the 6th chapter, verse 6. Here's Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. About what? That the will of God is good, perfect, and acceptable. I don't, I may have them out of order, but that's the three, right? Good, I think it's good, acceptable, and perfect, right? I, they say, stop being conformed to the world. Stop being foolish. Stop being conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you come to understand that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. It is, it is so wonderful when you find that in your, in your soul. When that settles in your heart, it, it makes every day just bright. Transformed. See, we don't realize we've been conformed until you have an opportunity to be transformed. Nobody knows they're being conformed to the world until they get saved and know they, that what transformation. They know they, they, they bought into the world system. You get saved, now it's all about transform. 
transformed by the renewing of your mind. Once that starts, you go like, holy catfish, and that's how. And it begins to change what, what, what the conformity of the world is to a transformity of the, that's old man, new man. It's exactly what that is. It's old man, new man. Conform to the world's old man. New man is transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's new man thinking. And, and, and what the Holy Spirit does is he keeps changing that, pulling you out of that muck and mire and setting you on high ground. Transformation is high ground. Listen, it brings back a listen. Conformity to the world takes, takes everything that God created you to be and, 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 and slumps it, dumps it. It's, it's living in a dump. The prodigal son did it. Let's live in the dump. What, tra what salvation does is get you out of the dump, and what transformation does is put you on a high hill. And on that high hill is the light of Christ that shines farther than you could imagine. Didn't he say that? A light set on a hill? That's who we are. That's transformation. Transformation puts us on a higher hill. We're on a little hill, then we're on this. The first thing, we're on one of the top of the mountains, and the light, the higher the mountain, the, the greater the light, right? As far as distance, I guess. I've never been on the highest mountain. But I would think. Okay? And here's the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God is when God allows the free will of man to choose against the directive will. He permits it. Jonah is a classic example of that. Jonah. God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach the gospel. I want the, these people to get saved. And Jonah goes like, nope, not, you got the wrong guy. I'm not going to do that. And so he runs the opposite direction, doesn't he? He gets on a boat and, and travels uh, 100 miles away from where he ought to be. He ought to have been going another 100 that way. He goes another that way. And God lets him go. And he puts a storm on him. He doesn't change his mind about what he's going to do. And he, he goes through, God goes through a whole warning, uh, you know, shooting, you know, across the bow of the ship, so to speak. They get Jonah. Everybody else is aware we're in trouble. Uh, God is stirring up something out there. Not Jonah. He's just sleeping in the, in the, in the bottom of the boat. No, there's one place you don't need to sleep in a storm is the bottom of a boat, people. And so, here's Jonah, permissive will of God. God allows it. In Luke, the 17th chapter, 23, it's three words. Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> it's not the shortest verse, but it's the second one. First one is Jesus wept. The second one is remember Lot's wife. <laughs> because it is remember Lot's wife that caused Jesus to weep. No, I don't know. You know what I mean? But it is that idea. <laughs> so when, if you want the whole story, and you should, I mean, wouldn't, it, wouldn't you be curious? Lot's, remember Lot's wife? Well, when I read that, I was a young believer. I went, where am I going to find that? And so somebody had to help me find it because we didn't have, back that day, I didn't have a, a fancy study Bible that cost $50, $60. I was trying to get food. <laughs> so I just had an old Bible that somebody gave me. And so I didn't know where it was. And so I had to go ask some people, anybody know where Lot's wife is found? They go like, oh, yeah, well, let's find it somewhere in Genesis. And so we started through walking through Genesis till we found it. So I wrote it down for you. It's in the chapter 19, 17 through 26. And you find the directive will of God. The angels go in and they say, God has sent us to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The whole valley, pff, it's going up. It's going to be, I mean, you got to get out of here. And they give her a direct or they give her the directive will of God. They tell her, tell her exactly how to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the things that they made a big point about, like, you're not focused. Look at me. Get focused. I got this. You don't miss this idea. Don't look back. Right? Get focused. Now. I'm telling you, do not look back. Repeat that after me. Do not look back. Do not stop on your way out and do not look back. You, you do not, 
Don't look back. So, remember Lot's wife? What did she do? She looked back. And what did she become? Why did she become a pillar of salt? No. Why did she become a pillar? That's true. Why did she become a pillar of salt? Why not a pillar of steel? Why not a pillar of ice? Well, because of the call. Yeah, that's what that whole region was known as. We came from what? Our bodies came from what? You know what hers went back to? Salt. There's a lot to be remembered about Lot's wife. But I'll tell you what's important to you is in the 19th chapter, verse 17, when they said to her, do not look back. <clears throat> okay? The direct will of God says, this is what God wants you to do. The permissive will is what he's willing to let you go through with your volition up to a point. And when that point, when you hit that point where you are now working against the plan of God, he overrules you. And the book of Jonah is a great book on that. He overrules you. And at some point, he overrules Jonah. What's he do with him? Has him thrown overboard. And he sinks to the bottom of the, he sinks all the way down, rolls down a mountain. According to the Bible, he rolls down a mountain under the water and at the foot of the mountain, seaweed wrapped around his head, and he was done. Until a big fish came along and swallowed him. Now you say, that's a whopping fish story. I know. I know. I know. Do you think it's true, Ron? Yeah, because Jesus referred to it, referred to his death, burial, and resurrection about it. Didn't he? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the belly of the earth. That's one of them, isn't it? Can't have three days and die on Friday, bury on Saturday, and up on Sunday and have three day, full days. That's for sure. But, you know, if you don't count anymore, I guess it don't matter. Oh, the overruling will of God, it supersedes all the other categories of his will. We see it in Genesis, for example, in the 12th chapter, 10 through 30, with Abram and Sarah. And he gets all panicky uh, because he's got a beautiful wife. And, uh, and listen, at that time, he's uh, 75, she's 65. And listen, she was beautiful when she was in her 90s. Men were still going like, whoa. Now, I don't know if that's just the way desert men are or what. You know, <laughs> if I'd have been stuck in a desert for 40 years, I might have thought that it's a, it's a woman. But apparently she was a beauty. Uh, Genesis 12, chapter 10 through 30, uh, he was afraid, you know, Pharaoh, if Pharaoh will come and take it. So you remember the story? He says, tell, tell him that you're my sister. And sure enough, he comes and gets her. And then God shows up, doesn't he? And God shows up and tells Pharaoh, you're in deep trouble. And he says, I don't see how that's possible. And he said, well, you took a woman, you took a woman who's another man's. And th this part of my family, this part of my family. And so if you don't give her back, you'll have no family. <laughs> you're not going to take somebody from my family and think your family's going to live. So put her, give her back. And so, you know, he confronts Abram and says, oh, what kind of a person would do this to me? Your God showed up last night and threatened me. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? He didn't show up and threaten Abram. Why? Because Abram was supposed to operate by the will of God. And he allowed him to permission to a point that it would interfere with the plan of God. That woman can't be, Pharaoh can't have that woman. Only Abram can have that woman because that's the seed of Christ. And Abraham knew that. Just act, acting foolish, isn't he? 
And what's about, what did Ephesians 5, 17 tell us? Don't act foolishly. Understand the will of God. And so we have that story. And that's a wonderful story. In James, the second chapter, 21, 24, <coughs> he talks about Ab Abraham offering Isaac. And that's a wonderful story. And one day we'll get there. I don't know. We're in the book of James on Sunday. I don't know what, how long that will be. But I'll tell you the part that's missed in that whole story of um, that Genesis 22 where he, that story is found <laughs> of offering Isaac is Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, where they tell you something that nobody else tells you. James doesn't tell you this, nor does, nor does Genesis 22 tell you this. What Abraham came to understand in his heart when God said, go offer your son as a sacrifice. There was so much wrong with that idea, except that God said it. And what Revelation 11, chapter 17 through 19 says, that he began running doctrine through his mind. And as he did that, he realized that God raises the dead and that if he put him to death, God would raise him to life because he's the, he's the seed of the Messiah. And so he went along with the plan. I love that. That's called doctrinal rationale. That's called doctrinal rationale. That's being able to logically think something out under the plan of the will of God. I love that because... It is so on for a spiritual mature believer. So here's what's encouraging to us. The power of transformation is the change in this man's life from chapter 12 to chapter 22. And that gives hope to all of us, doesn't it? I mean, how important it is to walk the walk, not just the talk. Now, and, and another one that I have down there for you, God doesn't permit anyone or anything to interfere with the outcome of the plan of God. That's why overruling will of God. Nathan and David, after that Bathsheba incident, when he comes to him, that's a great story. And you see the same thing again, the overruling. And you know what he did? Listen, when he did, when David had an affair with Bathsheba, killed her husband, right? Did it indirectly, but it killed him. It was evil. I mean, sin, sin went to evil. God put David under the sin of death. He put him under the sin unto death. If you read the story, Nathan came to him and said, after David confessed his sin, remember he gave him a, a little parable in there, gave him a little parable story, and David said, oh, 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 and he said, but you're the guy. And, they, and it hit David like a brick, and he went, oh, and David confessed his sin, and Nathan said, it's a good thing you did that, sir, because you were going to die. And now only the child will. Because it can't be the seed of Christ. And you're, you carry the seed of Christ, and that child can't be the seed of Christ. And he lays out other things that David is going to pay the price for. Not obeying the will of God. See, we're held at a different standard based on our spiritual growth. The greater the rewards, but greater responsibility comes with it. Anyhow, it's an interesting story. I put it on your paper in case you wanted to read it later. You know what I like about that story with Isaac? Is God makes provisions for you. When, 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 when Abraham finally comes to, okay, I can do this. I see what God is. I can see a path for me in the will of God to do this. And he, he gets ready to do it. And the Lord tells him, don't do that. Don't do it. Wait. And then over here, he got, me, got this noise in the, in the brush. And there's a ram, the perfect sacrifice uh, that can be offered to God, right? The substitutional sacrifice. See, li listen, and listen. Now, I want you to attach two things. First Corinthians 10, 13. 
You remember he says, you know, he never put more on you than you're able to bear. But with that temptation, will make a way for you to escape, right? That's it. See, remember that story for that principle. That's it. Did he make a, did he, in fact, his name in that is the Lord provides. Well, anyhow. Now, here's one of the things, because you've heard me, you've heard me speak about the geographical operational mental will of God. Geographical operational mental will of God. Here's what I want to I want to make sure you understand about it. It applies it applies to all three categories. It applies to all three categories. It applies to the directive will of God. And then as that directive will of God begins to unfold in your life, it's going to play the same. It's going to this is a band that's going to go with it. This is a little Mexican band that travels with them. Three piece band. And I laid it out for you with the book of Jonah. I, I laid it out for you just so you could see that in your own plan of study. Okay? Look, it should make sense to you. If you start out with a geographical, mental, and operational will of God on the directive plan, you go out of permissive, then, listen, then it, 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 you leave one geographics to go to another one, Right? And then you're in a whole different ball game. It's called the permissive, and it's still operational. But what God has got to do, he's got to change you from that area back to where the overruling will of God is going to take you from there. It's going to bring you right back to where you started, geographic, operational, mental. Do you see that? That's how it works. See that? Well, you just have to study it. You'll see it. If you don't see it, we'll tell you again sooner or later. Here's my final point. Ah, uh, final point. New covenant believer can have confidence, and this this is take home. I'm not going to study that. This is take home. Can have confidence in six stages of new covenant grace. You can have confidence in saving grace, logistic grace, spiritual growth grace, suffering grace, dying grace, and surpassing grace. Listen to this. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place, that surpassing grace, the third heaven, by the blood of Christ, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. New and living from what? Old. The old, the old covenant. We're under a new covenant. We're in the new, new living way, which he inaugurated for us through what? The veil, that is, his flesh, his death, burial, and resurrection. That's his flesh. In the 8th chapter, verse 1, it says that that resurrected body of Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven is coming again. In the ninth chapter of Hebrews 8 through 12, he goes into discussion <coughs> with this premise. <coughs> ninth chapter, verse 8. The way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. You're not going to get to heaven and tell Jesus, listen, the way to heaven is, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except for me. <laughs> when did that happen? Died on the cross. What happened to the temple? Veil was rent from top to bottom. Boom, boom. Out of business. 70 AD, the temple is no longer in existence. Won't be until the second coming of Christ. The whole second coming of Christ is about the temple. It's just interesting. The way into the holy place had not yet been disclosed while the outer temple is still standing. In Hebrews 9, 24, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself. Watch this now. And now there, there now, in heaven itself, there now to appear in the presence of God, what? On behalf of us all. You know what that is? That's his advocacy. That, that's at 1 John 2, 1, my advocacy. We have an advocate in heaven for us on earth. You think the devil is still not engaged in the angelic arm? Of course he is. But he has to deal with the big man. He has to deal with the big man. He has to deal with Christ. He's seated on the right hand of God the Father. He's the advocate. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. 
when you when you read the next two ones, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 and Luke 24, 43, you do this on your own. Listen, what, pay attention to the difference between the two next verses. Pay attention to them. Pay attention to them. Because there's been a living new way presented. Pay attention to it. Let's have prayer and go home. Or wherever you go on Halloween. Did you? Oh, no. Uh -uh. No, that's too dangerous. Well, we're all dressed for it anyhow, aren't we? Here we go. Father, thank you for these that have come our way to study with us this night, both by automobile and by internet. We pray, Father, this is not one of those lessons you get in one setting, if you're new to it, but it's well worth a read. Pull this off the internet. Pull this off from doctrinalstudies.com. Pull it off. It'll be up there within a few days. Rare to go for you. Pull it down and study it. Look up all the verses. Study it at, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he will reveal to you wonderful things as he did in my life. My prayer for you tonight is come out of being conformed to the world and into the new dynamics of transformation through Jesus Christ. And the way you get out of confirmation into transformation is you got to believe that Jesus came into this world to die on a cross on your behalf. In your place. And when that was completed, he was he spent three days in Sheol, in burial, and was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in your life when you believe the gospel of Christ. Because he brings life to a mortal body of immortality. We're so thankful for it. God, our heart can hardly stand to think about all this. It is so amazing. It is so marvelous. It is so far out there. I can't imagine anybody not wanting that. My prayer is that those who have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, this would be the night. Let it be Halloween. This would be a good one. Get saved tonight, my friend. Get saved by believing that Christ died for you, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. It's called the gospel. And when you believe, that gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. You can have it now. You can have it in a split second of time. You can get it faster than you, you can do the, the speed dial on a microwave. I mean, how good is that? For our, we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.